Hey there, grace and peace to you all today. It's Captain Roger from the Salvation Army Hanford Corps here in California. Um, welcome to The Shield Online, our weekly worship and study time. We have been looking at the instructions Jesus gave to his followers, and we're discovering that even though they sound simple, they all have these life-changing depths to them. Many of them would have been quite the opposite of the culture of the day, and sadly, we've really seen that this is still the truth. Following the teachings of Jesus as laid out is counter to our own culture, both the Western mindset of Americans and counter to much of the evangelical culture of the church as well. Now, maybe I'm reading too much into it. I'll let you decide for yourself, especially as we move forward into today's beatitude from Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. This is Matthew 5, 8. Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. In um, Luke 5, there's a story about what happened when Jesus called a certain fisherman to come follow his way. It says, One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats belonging to Simon and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Uh, Simon's brother Andrew, he had been a disciple of John the Baptist, but had recently begun to follow Jesus after John had indicated that he, he was someone to be honored. Uh, one night, a short time before this, Andrew had introduced Simon to Jesus and they had stayed up late into the night talking. So when the man from Nazareth asked to use his boat as a speaking platform, Simon agreed and got a front row seat to hear what was being said. The uh, story in uh, Luke 5, and we're at verse 4, if you're trying to follow along, uh, it goes on. When he'd finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Now, I can't help but read this as sarcasm from the fisher. Obviously, Jesus knew nothing about fishing. To catch anything in the Sea of Galilee, you fished in the dark early morning hours in the shallow areas where your nets would trap those schools of fish down near the ground. To throw your nets out at midday in the deep, that's foolishness. They're going to catch nothing but a good laugh at the expense of the carpenter's son. Still, it wouldn't hurt anything and might make for a good story later, so yeah, why not? Verse 6 says, When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. It's impossible. And yet, there were the fish. And as the men fought to keep the catch they could without letting so much water in over the nearly submerged sides of their vessels, Jesus perched off to one side with this smile that looks like he's trying not to laugh at the crew's amazement. Yeah, at least that's how I picture it. Verse 8 says, When Simon Peter saw this, meaning the catch, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. See, he knew right then he was in the presence of, in the presence of, well, something greater than he understood in the person of Jesus. And he was suddenly very aware that his self, his life wasn't exactly what you would call holy. And here he was next to someone who had something and he didn't want his uncleanness to interfere with this other man's holiness. Get away from me. Psalm 139 reminds us that the Lord knows us completely and inescapably. Better even than we know ourselves, the psalmist asserts. The author goes on to talk about God's knowing the full truth of each of us, how we're put together and what we do, both the light and the darkness. And he, suddenly the, the author wishes for more holiness in the world that he lives in, and he cries out against the sin that surrounds him. In Psalm 139, verse 19, he says, If only you, God, would slay the wicked... Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. Oh, yes. Yes, they're so evil, Lord. These people around me, they're so wicked. They're hate-filled folk who only want to destroy. You should get rid of them. Kill them. Kill them. I hate them. Hate them so much. And then he realizes he is them. 
And his cry against sin becomes a cry for help from a holy God. Verse 23, search me, God, know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Oh, not my will, Lord, not my judgment, yours. It's not the sin of my neighbors I need to deal with. It's mine. Oh, Lord, I am a sinful man. In... Uh, Psalm 73, another songwriter offers a verse with the same understanding, just bursting out of it. Psalm 73, right at the beginning, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I would nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He said, ah, for a moment I, I stepped away. I wanted to live the life of someone who rejected God. I felt that desire to do ungodly things, to live free of boundaries and responsibilities or caring about anyone but myself. But God is good to those who are pure in heart. The song goes on to say that the author caught himself when he realized that leaving God's path would hurt people around him that he cared for as well as those that he didn't. And that those who were far from God, those who left the source of their life behind, would find themselves heading into death. So he was coming back and good for him. I think that turning back to God is important and that we should all carefully evaluate whether we're heading towards or away from our source of life. But I think too many people read passages like this and think that it means God is only good to those who are steady and strong in their faith. Those who walk his path without failure, without doubt, living out every command of God as if their life depended on their ability to do so without mistake. That's not how life works for most of us though, is it? One of the sages of the Talmud, uh, Rabbi Joshua ben Levi, he says it's not about living a perfect life. It's about the intent with which we live. He says that purity of heart refers to a heart in which good inclination reigns. What he's saying is that intent matters. There was a uh, do this real quick. There was an argument across the centuries about a passage from Exodus 22. Um, we would call it uh, Exodus chapter 22, verses 7 through 9. It says, if a man gives to his neighbor money or objects to watch over and it is stolen from the house of the man, if the thief is found, he will make double restitution. If the thief is not found, the owner of the house will be brought to the sanctuary to learn whether or not he reached out his hand to his neighbor's possession. Concerning every account of transgression, concerning an ox, concerning a donkey, concerning small livestock, concerning clothing, concerning all lost property, where someone says, this belongs to me, the matter of the two of them will come to God. Whomever God declares guilty will make double restitution to his neighbor. There was a whole process for the way they determined what God was saying about who was guilty or not guilty, but that's not what we're talking about today. Today, we're going to just talk about what, what does this mean? What is the argument going on here? Well, the students of the Rabbi Hillel said, you're only guilty from the moment you actually lay hands on your neighbor's property to take it for yourself. They said that's why it's written that the judges needed to determine if they had reached out for the property. Uh, no, no, said students of the Rabbi Shammai. One is declared guilty by their intention to lay hands on something. That's why it's written that in every account of a crime, guilt is to be determined and restitution is to be made. Whew. Now, a lot of the rabbis in Jesus' time sided with Shammai. They said, from the moment a person intends to sin, he or she is just like the person who has actually committed infidelity against God. And Jesus seems to have agreed with them. In a few minutes, when he's done sharing the Beatitudes, he's going to explain how to live them out by giving examples such as this one. This is Matthew 5, verses 21 through 22. Jesus said, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, 
that anyone who's angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Uh, Raka means uh, empty-headed one or uh, you idiot, essentially. Now, here... With what Jesus is saying, it doesn't take raising a hand against another person to be guilty of their death. Using your words to kill their spirit is equal in his estimation. Even keeping your anger heated towards someone means you will face judgment of your intent. And Jesus reinforced this idea a moment later, too. Look down a couple of verses, Matthew 5, verses 27 and 28. He said, uh, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, I'm reading that from the NIV, and it's a common translation, but it's not actually great in English. Um, where it says anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery has led to some troublesome interpretations, including ones where a woman can't wear what she wants because her very appearance is somehow going to inflame men with lust, forcing them into sin. But that is the opposite of what Jesus is saying. Here's a better translation. This is from the Lexham English Bible. Jesus says, I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You see the difference? Uh, anyone, let's see, uh, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery. Uh, uh, but anyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And see, there's the difference. It's about intent and follow through. It's not about temptation. Your lust is your responsibility. It's not the responsibility of that person that you are choosing to fantasize about, right? Temptation is not a sin. What you do with the temptation becomes the problem. Intent matters. Thoughts are not intent. Ideas are not sin. What you do with those ideas, that matters. So, when does an idea turn into intention? And, as often is the case, we're looking at this from the wrong side. Instead of asking, well, how close can I get to that electric fence of sin before it zaps me? We would be better off just asking, how do I live with a pure heart? Right? Well, to the people of Bible times, the heart was where they thought that our will and our intellect sat. It's in the center of our bodies, therefore it must be the center of our thinking and choices, right? And when Jesus said we are to be pure in heart, the word he used is katharos, which means to be clean, unmixed, or undivided, right? Pure, katharos, unmixed. That means being pure in heart isn't about living a perfect life with no questionable thoughts or ideas popping up. Instead, it's about choosing not to mix those thoughts into your decision making. It's about making the ways of God the focus of our heart without letting other things get in the way. In Philippians 3, Paul writes to his family uh, there about staying focused on the goal, keeping the goal in mind. Uh, Philippians 3, this is from uh, the middle of uh, verse 12 through verse 14. Paul writes, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. That's the goal. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Yeah, sounds inspiring, right? It is inspiring. To press on towards a goal is to make that goal the center of your life and choices. Anything that blocks or hinders or distracts from reaching that goal needs to be let, let go of. And that doesn't mean you shut out every other thing. That goal, though, it needs to be the main thing all the time. All the time. Psalm 86.11 says, Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Undivided, undiluted, pure. Give me a pure heart that I may honor your name, Lord. And if our goal is to be pure in heart, 
We need to keep our hearts unmixed. We need to have integrity to honor our commitment to God at all times, right? That's all that means. Simple, <laughs> right? Jesus uh, would go on during his uh, Sermon on the Mount to warn followers about this. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, he says, No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Yeah, or God in sex, or God in your addiction, or God in power, or God in violence, or God in anything else that will keep you from relying on his faithfulness instead of something else. Why? Why would we want to live this way? What benefit is there for us in it? Well, Jesus says the pure in heart are blessed because they will see God. Uh, seeing God. I mean, wow, that, that's kind of... Early in the Exodus story, God promises he's going to be with Moses and the people. And Moses, having a moment, uh, he says something to the effect of, can, can you prove it? Could you just show yourself to me? This is in Exodus chapter 33, starting at verse 19. And the Lord said, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. The uh, idea being that there's something so different, so beyond our ability to grasp, so holy in the face of the unholiness of fallen humanity that we cannot look directly at God. At least not right now. Verse 21, then the Lord said, There is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft in the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. So even Moses isn't able to see God's full glory, but he is able to see where God was and the evidence of his having been there. Charles Price says that when we are single-minded in our disposition towards God, when we are focused on seeing God, we begin to see him all around us. Uh, Psalm 19.1 The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. <laughs> Prophet Isaiah said there are seraphs in heaven calling out, Holy is God, the whole earth is filled with his glory. That's what we're looking for, the glory of God, and we can see it. If God allows it. If we look for it. The rabbis talked about seeing God as seeing the face of the Shekinah. Shekinah was a, a way to refer to the glory of God's presence. It was often described as, as being like a light. To feast your eyes on the Shekinah was to refresh yourself by viewing the splendor of God. It was said that everyone would see God after death, which would be the highest bliss for the righteous, but the greatest terror for the unrighteous. Do you want to see God? The disciples of Jesus wanted to. Uh, John chapter 14, verse 8 through 10, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Jesus is God made visible to our understanding. He is the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus talked about a day when everyone would see him in his glory, seated on his throne, and how he would then separate the people into two groups, those who had seen God in life and those who hadn't. And he thanked the group who had seen him for doing so. Thank you for seeing me. 
And he invited them into the fully realized kingdom of God. And then they were confused because they didn't realize they had seen him in the way that he described. Matthew 25, verses 37 through 40. Jesus said, then, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothes you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. This then is how we can see God now. Yes, we can see him in the glory of nature and creation and all those kinds of things that you can see when you go into the wilderness. Those things you can see when you don't go into the wilderness. If you look around, you can say, wow, God is amazing. Look at all this great creation. But we see God most deeply, most directly in Jesus and in others. The image bearers of God. Remember back in Genesis, God said, we're going to create humankind in our image. Yeah. We can see God in the least, in the most in need. We can see him in the hungry and we can see him in the refugee. We can see him in those who are desperately in need and those who are sick. In the imprisoned and in the oppressed, we can see him every time we choose to see others in the ways Jesus showed us to see them. If our goal is to see God, then our goal is to see the world like Jesus does. And the Beatitudes, these blessings he's talking about, these commands to his people, they build on one another. Each one reveals how the ones before it help us connect to the blessing of God and to be the blessing of God. To be pure in heart, we must be poor in spirit. We need to know our own spiritual condition and need. We need to mourn our own sin and that of the world too. We need to be meek, relying on God's power, God's leading. We must hunger for a right relationship with God and with others. And we must be merciful. Got to allow our own poverty and grief and reliance and hunger to grow a sense of sympathy and tenderness towards others. They have the same needs. The pure in heart understand and feel our common human struggles and failures and respond to those instead of pushing them aside or ignoring or belittling them or just lashing out or trying to destroy them in other people. That doesn't mean that we have to be perfect. <laughs> Thank God. It does mean we need to be filled with intent. It means trying to bring out our, our thoughts and emotions, our fears and our dreams into God's light, truth, and grace. Psalm 139 ended with those verses. Remember, search me, God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's not about destroying our enemies. It's about loving others the way God does. It's about seeing God in the face of each and every other person. True desire for holiness. The way to be pure in heart is simply to desire more Jesus, to act more like Jesus, to be pure in heart is to take in and live out compassion, patience, and love. And then you will see God. In the next world? Absolutely, yeah. But in this one as well. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Amen? Yeah. Hey, Whoever you are, wherever you've gone, do you want to see God? Seek him and you will find him. You have nothing to fear. Wherever you are, whatever circumstance you are in, God is with you. He is with you. Just go with God. Grace and peace to each and every one of you in the coming week. I'll see you next time.